All right, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Ed Albin, a department chair for space studies at American Public University. And we have a, a special uh, star party tour for you of the autumn skies uh, from Charlestown, West Virginia, where the weather has miraculously cleared off tonight. We've had a lot of rain uh, this week and the clouds began to break about an hour ago. So I'm knocking on wood that we can uh, have a tour of the night sky and show you some really uh, cool astronomical uh, objects in the sky. What, what you're seeing now on the screen, this is a live view uh, from Charlestown, West Virginia at the American Public University campus on top of the IT building. Uh, we have a very large telescope. This is uh, a plane wave 24 inch Cassegrain uh, reflector. The, the mirror, it collects light using a mirror at the base of the telescope. And that mirror is two feet across. So imagine your eyeball, your, your eye, uh, your pupil maybe a quarter of an inch collecting light. So if you can imagine your, your eyeball two feet across, how much light you could collect. So we astronomers like to call uh, these telescopes light buckets. Now, what is what makes this really interesting is I am not in Charlestown and most folks, if not everyone, has already gone home and it's completely dark in the observatory. I'm illuminating the telescope with an infrared light and you're seeing it with an infrared camera. I am actually in uh, just outside of Atlanta. And tonight I'm at my personal observatory because it's really clear here in Georgia. I'm, I'm, I'm actually under very, very dark skies at the Deer Lick Astronomy Village, about 110 miles east of Atlanta. And so what, what is cool is I powered up the telescope and the 30, uh, two foot dome, the ash dome that you see there and opened up the slit and am able to control this uh, completely remotely. So uh, this is an interesting demonstration of what our faculty can do with an online remote observatory and our students. And this telescope has been running. Um, we had it installed in 2015, so we're going on six years, and it's heavily used by faculty and especially students uh, in our graduate program where they um, do observations as part of their capstone thesis. But it's also used in the curriculum at the undergraduate level. We have uh, undergraduate BS and an associate degree in space studies. And both in the um, bachelor's degree and the master's degree program, we have concentration in astronomy. So students have hands-on experience using the telescope um, in the curriculum remotely. A number of courses, uh, three courses come to mind, our introduction to astronomy at the undergraduate level, tools of the observatory, and also a brand new cosmology course, in addition to a course on stars and galaxies where students can photograph stars and galaxies. So this, this is really cool. In our graduate curriculum, uh, the observatory is used uh, again in our capstone course, Space Studies 699. Also, we have a uh, 633 astronomical instrumentation where students learn how to use telescopes such as this optical telescope. Lunar geology course, great for taking photographs of the moon and our, also our 631, I like to call beyond the solar system astrophysical studies. So uh, a great um, part of the space studies curriculum. Okay, 
Uh, so what are we going to do tonight? Um, let me just show a couple of slides. Um, here's a, a, a daytime view of the IT building, and you can just see the dome on top. And a couple of pictures of the telescope tonight. We're using a SBIG 16803, very sensitive research grade um, CCD camera on the back of the 36 inch telescope. Uh, the telescope also has a Teleview um, five inch refractor, which will give us wide uh, field views of the sky. And we can actually get the entire moon in the field of view. But tonight what we're gonna do is move the telescope around in celebration of fall. And we will be taking some images in real time of a number of celestial targets uh, that you see here. We're, I, I decided what we're gonna do is we're gonna go from nearby in the galaxy uh, to further out. And these are what we collectively call deep sky targets. The, the telescope is currently configured uh, for objects beyond the solar system. So. Uh, the moon's not going to rise until um, a little bit, or maybe around nine o'clock or so. So we'll uh, not be able to see the moon. Jupiter and Saturn are uh, in the night sky. Uh, however, uh, the camera we ha currently have on the telescope, um, some of the, the work our students have been doing has been more uh, deep sky sky observations. So we're going we're, we're gonna to focus tonight on things beyond the solar system, including a beautiful star in the Big Dipper called Mizar. One of my favorite nebulae, the Apple Core, sometimes called the Dumbbell Nebula, looks sort of like a dumbbell, in Volpecula, the little fox, uh, 1360 light years away. The wild duck cluster, M11, Messier object, M11, 6,200 light years away. And you see we're moving out. This is from, from the Earth. Um, the great Hercules star cluster, and this is fantastic, 25,000 year, uh, light years away in the constellation of Hercules. And our grand finale tonight will be the Andromeda galaxy, two and a quarter million light years away, another whole galactic system of, of stars. So um, what we'll do is uh, go back to our uh, view of the telescope. And I am going to be jumping from one menu to another to show you how we move this around. We're currently situated on a star called Deneb. I was doing some focusing on Deneb and here's a 10 uh, second exposure uh, with, with our CCD camera. The bright object is Deneb. It's really overexposed at 10 seconds, but you can see all of the really sharp stars in, in the background. Deneb is about 1500 light years away. It's part of the summer triangle. If it's clear where you are tonight, uh, you have Deneb, Altair, and Vega forming a, a nice triangle high over high overhead. I can show you what I'm using to control uh, the software is what, what you're seeing here. We use a, a program called the Sky X, the professional version, and this is produced by some great folks in Colorado, Software Bisque. And so we have a virtual rendering of, of the night sky, and the telescope currently is here on the tail of um, Cygnus the Swan. And what we're going to do is move over to Mizar uh, at the end of the handle of the Little Dipper. That, that is where we're, we're going to go. And our telescope is going to have to do something because it's an equatorial mount. And while we're moving over there, I'll, I'll give you a bit more detail about our wonderful instrument, plane waves CDK 24 inch on a astrophysics um, <laughs> mount. But we're going to have to cross this line called the meridian. And that's a line that's straight overhead. 
as, as our students know, goes from due north straight overhead to zenith and then due south. Our, our telescope is going to do something called a meridian flip, <laughs> which is it, it's it sounds more exciting than it act, actually is. It's going to go from one uh, the western hemisphere of the night sky over. Uh, well, well, actually, we're in the eastern hemisphere and we'll switch over to the, the western hemisphere. So why don't we do this? Um, I will. Um, Go ahead and hit slew. There we go. And we're confirming. And what you'll see is the yellow bullseye moving ever so slowly toward the star Mizar. And this, this is cool here. So we're, we're going from the eastern sky over to the western sky and you can see on the back of the telescope although it's bright red during the daytime everything is uh colors are are washed well, out ended. uh colors are washed out because we're using an infrared uh camera so there's the dome we'll catch up and um so we'll let it let it drift over in a line. And while that's happening, let me say a few more things about the telescope. Lots of cool things attached there. The ash dome, it's a 32 foot diameter dome, uh, the observatory. And again, this is in Charlestown, West Virginia. And I'm here in the boondocks of East Central Georgia. When I step outside tonight before the moon comes up, um, the Milky Way will be overhead. We're, we're at a, a very, very dark sky site. So anyway, uh, I always found, find that fascinating that we can uh, power up and control uh, the telescope with nobody on campus. And our students find that fascinating as well. Okay, the telescope pier is number two. Uh, we're sitting on top of the IT building. And this pier runs all the way through the building in, down into the ground into bedrock. And it's it doesn't physically touch the floor or anything. So we get no vibration. Number three is the uh, plane wave. Actually, it's a plane wave. <laughs> I misspoke, not at, uh, it's a plane wave um, A200 mount, heavy duty mount. And then uh, four is our telescope, uh, the CDK 24 inch. And again, to give you an idea how big this is, the back of the telescope is two feet across. The mirror, the collecting concave um, collecting mirror is, is two feet across. And then we have uh, the Telview um, 127 refractor, 127 millimeter refractor, five inch refractor. And our, we actually uh, have two cameras, the, uh, the, the main one on, on the um, telescope the, the, that we're using tonight, the STX uh, uh, 16803. And Sarah, I'm sorry, Ed. Uh, Sarah Guthrie is asking if you can perform planetary observations with this telescope. We can. We, we actually can. And for fun, I will put it on Jupiter tonight. You can see the moons of Jupiter. Um, a planetary imaging typically requires very high resolution uh, and magnification to, to pull in planetary detail. And so it's another whole configuration. But uh, the telescope in its wide field configuration can now, um, we, we can look at planets. Uh, you're not going to see a lot of detail, but what is really cool with a wide field view, uh, we can see uh, anywhere from two to four of Jupiter's moons. And I think three of those moons are visible tonight. All right. So let's, uh, those are the parts of the telescope. Um, and we're coming back over to our instrument, which is lined up. And hopefully those clouds will stay away and we'll just do a short 
um, 10 second exposure and see what we get. Keeping in mind that this star, it's the center star in the handle of the Big Dipper, or the, it's in the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear, the tail of, of the Big Bear. There we go. Okay, so we are, we're, we're actually seeing, uh, this is Mizar. Uh, there are two stars that are sitting right on top of each other. And over here is Alcor. And, and th this is a nice target through uh, any telescope. If, if we had more magnification, uh, we're really set again for wide field imaging. We, we could uh, see if we could resolve those stars. Let me see if I can pull, pull that down. Yeah. So, so Mizar, this particular star here, the center star, in the handle of, of the Big Dipper is about 80 light years away. So that, it's pretty cool. We're seeing into the past. When you see that star, that's the way that star appeared 80 light years away. And, and for our uh, Milky Way galaxy, every star you see on a clear night is part of our Milky Way galaxy. Uh, we have maybe a trillion stars in our beautiful galaxy. And this is uh, 80 light years is not very far away. The nearest star is Alpha Centauri, about four and a third light years away, which is in the Southern hemisphere. We can't see that. Okay, so let's see, let's do this. We're gonna move slightly further out to the Apple Core Nebula and to show you how uh, it's really easy uh, the interface is, and we have our students uh, control the telescope uh, through TeamViewer or any desk, they can remote in. And we, we have a um, faculty and an astronomy observatory lab assistant, typically a graduate student, um, and then and then as, as our current, uh, Terry, our current graduate lab assistant is, uh, is graduating. So he's in the process of training a, a new graduate uh, assistant uh, to, to help out in, in the observatory. So folks like me don't have to be up every night <laughs> from, from dusk till dawn. Uh, our graduate assistants love, love that. And uh, I do too, if I didn't have to get up and <laughs> grade papers and whatnot. Okay, so let's do this to show you how easy it is. We're gonna put in um, the Messier, Charles Messier. Messier was a French astronomer and he, uh, the, the coolest, what we call deep sky objects are Messier objects. And this one is M27, uh, the 22nd uh, or the 27th object in his catalog. And it's over in a little tiny constellation called Volpecula, <laughs> the little fox in the sky. So we're gonna have to um, head to the east and do another meridian flip. And we'll watch the telescope and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, tell you when it does, does the flip. Okay, so there we go. So we found it. And now what we're going to do is uh, simply hit the slew button. And we like to have this up for students. So they'll double check, make sure they're not going to slew to something below the horizon, which uh, there's a warning system. And so do we want to slew to uh, this particular target in the new general catalog. In, it's NGC 6853. Uh, uh, but we, we like to call it the Apple Core Nebula. So there we go. Our telescope is tracing across the sky, approaching the meridian. When it crosses the meridian, it will be looking to the north right there. When you see the back of the telescope, our camera is in the south. So it's done the meridian flip, which is usually no big deal unless we're tracking an object, let's say like the Apple Core Nebula, in the east, 
and the telescope will compensate for the rotation of the earth. It has a clock drive on it. So it's ever slow, ever so slowly moving from east to west. Just like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, the stars, the moon, the planets are doing the same thing, as well as the Apicor Nebula. So they're moving in that direction. So the telescope will track, and you can see it's very high up. When it reaches um, the meridian, what it will have to do, that's when the meridian flip comes in. So when our students are doing a, a long-term uh, imaging project, let's say over four hours, perhaps following a variable star or an exoplanet transit, um, we, we can actually detect with our telescope giant, uh, super giant planets, giant Jupiters <laughs> around other stars. And the way we detect that, as that, that is moving, let me uh, show you, and I'm just sort of hopping. I didn't want this to be a slideshow. There we go. Uh, here you, you can see um, what we call photometry, light variations, whether it's a variable star, or exoplanet. And on the lower right-hand side, you see a giant Jupiter moving in front of its host star. So there's a, a little bit of an eclipse, only one to 2% dip in brightness, but our camera, is sensitive enough to detect that dip in brightness. So we can learn information on the orbital period of an exoplanet as well as the size of an exoplanet based on how long the dip is and how much light is, is uh, taken away from the brightness of the star. And this is referred to as photometry, exoplanet transits, and um, <clears throat> So let's let's go back over here. There we go. Our dome is trying to catch up and figure out. There it is. It seems to be happy there. So we'll go back to our uh, software. And our students become familiar with using uh, very sophisticated software packages like the one I'm using here, Maxim DL Pro 6 which has a photometry um, function built in where we can uh, build light curves for exo exoplanets, variable stars, or even determine the rotational period of an asteroid based on how that light uh, varies with time. So let's take, uh, actually, we're gonna boost this up. Um, let's try 30 seconds. I can recall back when I was in high school, when the crust was cooling on the planet in the 70s, <laughs> um, having my uh, 35 millimeter camera, this was before CCD or digital cameras, and going out with my eight inch telescope and taking images with Tri-X film, Tri-X um, uh, 400 film. And it was, I tell my students, it was quite challenging then. Uh, I can recall one night imaging, uh, taking 36 exposures. Oh, there we go. <laughs> the sky gods are being good to us. It's, it's staying clear. Let me enhance this just a little bit. There, there's the Apple Core Nebula. See if you can see what appears to be an Apple Core. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. Got a lot of software and stuff running here. So anyway, after waiting three or four days and heading over to the uh, the uh, department, no, not the department store, the drugstore to pick up my images that I took on a clear night, um, they would come back. There was one time when all of them were out of focus. <laughs> and so I had to uh, go back and reload the camera tweak the focus and hope for the best uh, the next time. And in our digital age, what you see is what you get. It's out of focus. You can refocus the camera, uh, refocus the uh, telescope. So you're, you're not wasting days and money and all of that with out of focus uh, images. So, so what you have here is a planetary nebula 
And this one, I believe, is 6,200 light years away, still within our Milky Way galaxy in Volpecula. I like saying <laughs> Volpecula. And it's a, it's a horribly little constellation, but a lot of fun to say. This is a site where a star has died. This star um, was a star uh, uh, not unlike our sun, a, um, a main sequence star, uh, perhaps a, a yellow dwarf star like our sun. And when it ran out of fuel, uh, the star collapsed and the outer uh, layers of the star separated, forming this, uh, it, it's really a spherical shell around the star and using spectroscopy, uh, we see that this gas is moving out. It, it was expelled from the star and the star, as our sun will in 5 billion years, uh, it basically it ran out of uh, hydrogen at its core. Hydrogen burns into an ash of helium thermonuclear reaction. So when you lose the thermonuclear force trying to blow the star apart, gravity takes over. And so at the core of the apple core, this little white dot star is what we call a white dwarf, perhaps the size of the earth. At one time, it was a hundred times larger, uh, maybe 800,000 miles across. Now it's only about 8,000 miles across. And this is uh, once again, uh, the beautiful apple core. Now what we're doing tonight um, is just taking um, uh, the uh, black and white images. We do have the capability. Uh, we have a filter wheel where we can do RGB and our students learn how to combine, uh, combine uh, images. Uh, for example, if we took the luminance, which is no filter in there, and then did a red, green, and blue, the Maxim DL software can combine those images and give us a beautiful color image um, of the Apple Core Nebula. So that that would take <laughs> take a bit of time. Uh, so we're I'll I'll show you a couple of color images that uh, in my slide deck, but we want to try to look as at as many things as we can see. Let, let's see, how about an open star cluster? There are clusters of stars in the sky that are um, in our Milky Way. These are young um, clusters in the sky. And one of my favorite summertime star clusters, I, I just love the name that astronomers give to it, the wild duck. And when we take an image, we'll see if we can put the little stars together to make a, a duck uh, flying across the autumn sky. So this one, well, we're gonna have to do another meridian flip, but that's okay. It's always fun to, to watch the telescope move around. And, and we're going from nearby objects, um, going from near to far. That's why I'm sort of jumping around. Mizar, about 80 light years away, the Apple core, 6,200. And now we are heading over to the wild duck. Oh, <laughs> okay. The wild duck is actually 6,200 light years away. And I thought that was, um, the Apple core is 1,360 uh, light years away. Still pretty far away, but the uh, this cluster that we're going to see is is much further away. So let's go back and check my cheat sheet. So we are ready to move to our target. And once again, SLU, do we want to go? Yep. Over to the wild duck. And there goes the telescope. While it's moving, Daniel, if there are some questions that um, you want. Um, so no questions so far, except uh, lots of comments about how this is amazing. I agree. <laughs> um, there is one question from Darren Driscoll, and he's asking, is the new cosmology course just an elective? 
No, no. Good question. Um, this new cosmology course, 440, will go into, or 441, will go into the um, January catalog. So we are making that a required course in the astronomy curriculum. It, it's part of, of the um, concentration in astronomy. So that that is not an elective. However, if you want to take it, if you want to sort of build it into your curriculum, um, you can talk with an advisor and or myself and we can see we, we really love to tailor the curriculum to your needs so if let, let's say for example you are in uh, aerospace science and you want to take cosmology we may be able to see where we can fit that into the the curriculum all right uh, something cool sorry, here sorry uh Ooh. darren asks again uh for bachelor or masters that is the uh, bachelor's degree program, the four-year degree program. Yeah, the BS uh, degree in space studies. Uh -huh. Another question from Sarah Guthrie. Can students tour the observatory and perform research? Well, we can do virtual tours of the observatory and definitely research. Um, if you're interested in your final uh, undergraduate project, the 499 course, uh, let us know, myself or one of my astronomers, and we can definitely work with you on that. Now, typically at graduation, uh, prior to COVID, we uh, would, would take students uh, who were interested, who were there at graduation over to campus. Uh, typically, graduation is in uh, Washington, D.C., and Charlestown is maybe an hour or so away to tour the observatory. But with COVID, that, that is not happening over the next, um, uh, who knows what period of time. Maybe, maybe by uh, May, things will be better. We'll have to, to wait and see. But if you ever want a virtual tour, let us know, and we can walk you through uh, what's going on there, sort of like what I'm, I'm doing now. Now here you see the petals, it's almost like a flower. Uh, when I set up tonight, um, about 7 p.m., powered up the telescope and the dome and uh, the cameras, uh, these petals uh, were closed over the 24 inch mirror uh, to keep dust out. Optics don't like dust, and we don't like cleaning optics, <laughs> not because it's difficult, but because um, you don't want to take a chance of scratching uh, a beautiful mirror. It has to be done occasionally, so it's better to keep things closed uh, at night, or, or not at night, but during the day, and then we open up uh, at night. Okay, so here we are, and let's take another exposure. We'll zoom back out. This, this is a fairly large and uh, beautiful cluster of young stars. This one again, 6,200 light years away with an apple core, I stand corrected, 1,300 light years away. So I was jumping ahead. This is kind of a star party uh, thing and uh, that, that what we're doing now and, and something that um, with our, our student organization, uh, Students for the Exploration and, and Development of Space, SEDS, um, I've been talking with uh, faculty about doing a regular, maybe a quarterly star party. We can have fun just looking at, at things in the sky like this. I mean, it's very beautiful. The um, wild duck, I, I'm not <laughs> seeing a wild duck here. Let me, let me sort of dim it down. Maybe, uh, 
you can see some wings, uh, maybe a, a long neck here and some wings over here. <laughs> but this is astronomically important because it's a very young cluster of stars, a galactic cluster. Stars are born in groups from uh, clouds of dust and gas, nebula, uh, nebulas, and gravitational attraction uh, will pull these vast clouds together, forming um, clusters of stars that will eventually migrate out of the cluster. The sun, four and a half billion years ago, was born in such a cluster, and these stars will evaporate or migrate out of the cluster and find their own way around, around the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, let's, let's see what is next on the agenda. Oh, M13. Now here we're looking at a relatively young cluster of stars, perhaps a few tens of millions of years old. And that's astronomically, that's young. The sun is four and a half billion years old. Now we're gonna look at some stars that go back to the origin of the Milky Way galaxy, not the universe, but our galaxy. Some of the first stars to have formed in the Milky Way in what we call a globular star cluster. And this is one of my favorites. Charles Messier, back in the 1700s, cataloged it as M13. And today we call it the, the Great Hercules Star Cluster. So let's head over to this target that is 25,000 light years away. So we'll hit the magic slew button. <clears throat> Fortunately, we don't have to do the, the meridian flip. <clears throat> and uh, heading over to our next target in the sky. Do we have a, another question, Daniel? Yes, we do. Um, Carrie is asking, can we use the refractor telescope? Uh, yes, yes, the refractor <clears throat> can be used uh, for very wide field views of the sky. <clears throat> However, it, it requires powering down the um, camera on the, on the larger telescope, the 16803 camera, and then powering that up and, and um, checking it out to make sure, but it can be used for various research projects. Tonight, however, because we only have an hour, uh, I've decided that we're, we're, we'll just be using uh, the 24 inch, the, the, big, uh, the big telescope, the big eye. <clears throat> but good question though. Yeah, we can switch between cameras. It takes a little bit of time. Uh, the camera is cooled, currently cooled to minus 20 degrees C to um, uh, remove uh, noise, electronic noise. Uh, to give us a, a better image. So we'd have to slowly warm that up and then slowly cool the other camera down. If we had more time, we, we could definitely switch between the two. Okay, so this one, and I think you'll see why, why we call this particular uh, type of object a globular star cluster. So, We'll do a 30 second exposure. The, um, this target we're going to look at in Hercules is famous uh, for the message sent out um, by the great Arecibo radio telescope in Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico uh, back in 1974. Carl Sagan and his astronomical colleagues put together a digital message to ET to this collection of 300,000 stars. And the, the, he, he chose M13 because it is a, a very cool 
and beautiful target, even, even through a small telescope, and I'm a bit overexposed here with uh, a 30 second exposure. Let me see if we can pull it down. Nope. Let's go back to there. But you can see all of these stars. Um, so with one powerful signal to ET, <laughs> if such exist in that cluster of stars 25,000 light years away, uh, Carl Sagan uh, knew this broadcast, very powerful digital signal uh, would reach 300,000 stars at the cost of 25,000 years. So if, if we have intelligent life on a planet around one of those stars, they get the signal and then send the signal back, it's going to take another 25,000 years. So it's a 50,000 year investment in time. But one of my, my favorite objects this time of year to look at uh, here at the Astronomy Village, with it being so clear tonight, I'm probably going to pull out. I have an 18-inch uh, push-to telescope. This is, we're using a go-to telescope, what's called the 18-inch Dobsonian. And I've, I'm chomping to take a look at this tonight um, through my, my telescope. All right. So... Um, let me kind of just shift over here. I wanted to, this is a layout of the APUS observatory. You can see the 24 inch telescope and there, there is actually when you're on campus, um, <clears throat> because we're fully online, it's very rare, but I, I am currently connected to a computer, uh, the desktop below the observatory. I am using Microsoft remote desktop to go in and control everything. <laughs> so, and this is on top of the build. We also have this uh, weather station on top of the building, including a, a cloud sensor, a humidity sensor, a rain sensor. So if it starts to rain and I'm getting too enthusiastic about viewing the sky, the, the Telescope has smart technology. The observatory does and will automatically close the dome. <laughs> or if the humidity is approaching um, 80 to 90 percent, getting out, going up to 100 percent, it would definitely close close the dome on its own. All right. So I'm going to say we're, we're actually doing pretty good. Let me do this. Let me move to the Andromeda galaxy out beyond the Milky Way galaxy. And while I'm doing that, if, if anybody has a target they would like to look at, put it in the chat. And uh, maybe we can look at a target or two that, that um, our folks have uh, suggested. And we really appreciate you sitting in with us tonight. It's kind of unusual uh, to have a, a session this late. Um, but of course, with astronomy, it seems to work better at night uh, during the day, especially if we're using a large optical telescope. So we're heading off to the constellation of Andromeda for a look at the beautiful Andromeda galaxy, two and a quarter million light years away. Outside of the Milky Way, this is the most distant object that we'll look at tonight, at least on my list. It's taken light over two and a quarter million years to reach us. Let's watch this head over to the east. This target actually um, from a dark sky site, if, if you're uh, somewhere away from the bright lights of the city, the Andromeda galaxy, and we've all heard this quote, as far as the so eye can bad. see. This is as far as the human eye can see without a telescope. It'll look like a faint little smudge in the sky. Um, 
but you have to have very, very dark skies. And we use what we call averted vision, where you sort of look to the side and then it, it appears as a ghostly smudge of light. Okay, Dan, do, do we have a question or a request? We have, uh, well, we had several requests, uh, but it seems that uh, there are two votes for Pluto. Uh, <laughs> Stella Vision wants to see Europe. Shane Howell would like to see Betelgeuse, please. Uh, Arnold asks, can we see the Orion constellation? Okay. Wes O'Donnell asks, uh, how about the Orion Nebula? Yes, the, the Orion or Orion Nebula is my favorite. And I'll take a look. I don't think it's going to be above the horizon at this point. Um, it's it's um, a winter constellation, so probably won't rise until well after midnight tonight, it which includes Betelgeuse, the star Betelgeuse. So good, good suggestions though so let's let's snap a picture of the galaxy and then i'll come back and see <laughs> see if we can um have to move some stuff out of my way here i've got lots of software open oops there we go all right so we are there i want my camera that's what i'm looking for Okay, so let's go ahead and start. We'll start our exposure with Maxim DL. And while that's exposing, let me come over here. This is our star map here. Um, so you can see the moon is just, as we finish up, it'll be clearing the horizon. Uranus is below the horizon. You know, Pluto is there, <laughs> our dwarf planet. Um, yeah, for fun, we'll go to Pluto. The problem with Pluto is it's what we call 14th magnitude. So I need a reference star map to find it, but it's not very far from Jupiter which we can see the moons of Jupiter. So why don't we do this? Our next target, we'll go for Pluto since somebody requested it. There we go. And, and then uh, I'll show, it, it'll be in the field of view and we may have to up our exposure to a minute to pull it in. Um, and then, and then our, our grand finale tonight will be Jupiter. We'll look at some of the moons of Jupiter. All right. The Andromeda Galaxy. Without a telescope, this is as far as the eye can see. And what you're seeing is the core, slightly overexposed, of a galaxy that is even larger than the Milky Way. Our, our Milky Way galaxy is well over 120,000 light years across, but the Andromeda galaxy is even bigger and has well more than a million uh, or trillion stars. It's a much larger galaxy. The cool thing is the a Milky Way and Andromeda are approaching each other, moving in the same direction. And astronomers believe in the distant future, we're talking billions of years into the future, uh, the two galaxies will collide, perhaps forming one super galaxy. Okay, so there we have it, two and a quarter million light years away. And I always wonder when I look out at another galaxy with over a trillion stars, I always wonder who or what is looking back. All If there are a trillion stars, there are quite literally um, hundreds, hundreds of billions of planets out there. And the universe is uh, 14 plus billion or close to 14 billion years old, 13.8 billion years old. 
And so there could be civilizations out there, as Carl Sagan um, uh, always thought about and wanted to make contact out there with technology, telescopes uh, looking back toward us and our, our planet. That's something to think about. I, I think that is um, what gets a lot of us into astronomy. When I was a small boy growing up, that kind of thing blew my mind and made me think about the cosmos, as well as going, going back to the 60s, really when the crust was cooling on the planet, uh, the Apollo missions. Uh, I wish we could snag the moon as a grand finale. It won't quite be up high enough. But I was, I was really motivated by humans traveling to the moon. And it's really exciting now that NASA, with the Artemis program and working with SpaceX Starship, uh, is planning a return to the moon within the next, um, maybe within this decade. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Hopefully sooner than later. Okay, let's go by request, Pluto. Now keep in mind, Pluto, the dwarf planet is smaller than the moon and it's close to 4 billion miles from the sun. So it is going to look like a star. When it was discovered, in 1930 by an American astronomer, Clyde Tombach at Lowell Observatory. Uh, he, the way he detected Pluto was by um, looking at star fields, taking a picture, comparing it to an old star field, looking for something that moved uh, across the sky, uh, perhaps uh, one field was taken two or three months ahead or, or previously, Ended. and then we shoot it again and, and see if things uh, move. And this is how we discover asteroids. Okay, so the telescope is actually pointing very well, as it usually does, and the, the dome is taking a little bit of time to catch up, but let's, let's see go. So we are on Pluto, a couple of planets clustered over here. And I think Jupiter, you'll, you'll like Jupiter because we can see the moons, even though we're not configured for planets. Uh, we can definitely, I'm gambling, we're going to see a couple of moons pretty easily. Okay. Any, any other questions, Daniel, while we're. Yes. Yes. We do have uh, several questions. Okay. Um, from Diane Alexander, do Mitzar and Alcor have a dominant recessive orbit pattern or recognizable pattern with the binary Alcor and six stars in the group? Good, good question. From what I understand, Alcor is, is um, it's an apparent double star. Alcor is actually at a uh, different distance from Mizar. Now, Mizar, we could just barely start to re uh, resolve Mizar. That was our first target. And those are that's a true multiple star system, a binary star system. And, and what is interesting with really high resolution, Mizar separates into two stars, and then each of those uh, two stars separate into two more stars. So it's a quadruple star system. Okay, looks like our dome has caught up and we're running tight on time. So let me, uh, the telescope is there. Uh, let's, let's go up to one minute. <laughs> We'll collect a lot of photons of light. Pluto, this telescope will easily pick up Pluto. Now, I, I may not be able to point this out to you uh, without having a, a reference star map, a high resolution reference star map in front of me, but it will, it will definitely be in the field of view somewhere. 
Um, here's a question from uh, Yaya Ramat Sami, who is uh, actually one of our speakers tomorrow. And his question is, how far back can we see with this telescope? Oh, good, good question. Um, we can see very ancient and distant galaxies early, you know, when we look far back into the cosmos, we look further back into time and we see objects called quasars. And these are active nuclei of very young uh, galaxies. Well, Pluto is in there somewhere. I, I'm going to say one of these objects here, and either this one or that one is likely, because the telescope is pointing so well, it's either there or there, likely the fainter one. This, this is likely Pluto, but without a, a star map, I can't tell. It's gonna look like a little dot of light. But going back to your question, a quasar, uh, can be on the order of four to six um, billion light years away. Uh, I have looked at objects like that. I mean, they look like little smudges of light, but just to think that that light has been traveling for billions of years to reach us here. All right, in our grand finale, we'll finish up with Jupiter. We can click on it. That's another way of finding it with the software. If it's bright enough to see, you can do that. And so we will slew, go to Jupiter. And I'm hoping we can see a couple of moons tonight. Uh, here's a test for you. Can somebody put in the chat the names of the four largest moons of Jupiter? as we are swinging over to the west. And by the way, if it's clear where you are, if you go out after the presentation and look to the southwest, slightly west of south, it'll be high in the southern sky, you'll see Jupiter with a naked eye. It will be, until the moon gets up high, it will be the brightest object in the sky. Earlier in the evening over in the west was Venus, which was tremendously bright. Uh, sometimes we call it the evening star over in the western sky. It's great. You have kids, take them out, show them a couple of planets. And then in between and Jupiter and Venus, not far from Jupiter, a apparent um, distance angular distance in the sky is Saturn. You're looking at Jupiter, the next brightest object to the right or toward the west is Saturn. Venus is already set. You have to catch that right after sundown. Okay. So I always like to say, know your planets. If your wishes have not been coming true, if you've been wishing on bright stars, the first bright star you see in the night sky, there's a good chance you've been wishing on Jupiter or Venus. And this is why your wish is not coming true. <laughs> Another reason to know astronomy. <laughs> Apologies, bad, bad astronomy humor. Um, okay, we are parked on Jupiter and we've got one minute left. So let's do, we actually with a planet, we're gonna do a very short, <laughs> let's, we wanna pull in the moon. So let's try, try a two second exposure. Jupiter will likely be massively blown out in brightness. Yep, there we go. Here's Jupiter, a round ball, no details there, but those objects off, to either side are what we call the Galilean moons of Jupiter. I'm seeing, uh, and they're, it, it's like a miniature solar system. They're orbiting in the same plane. This is a, a star, a couple of background stars. 
likely we have uh, IO and Europa. It, and I, I can't see the chat right now. So hopefully um, folks have named off the bright moons of Jupiter, IO, Europa, Ganymede. Ganymede, this is likely Ganymede. It's the largest moon in the solar system, even larger than Mercury. So one moon is missing out of the field of view. It's either in front of the planet or behind the planet. Uh, could, be, could be Callisto, could be on the other side. Um, but <laughs> what we have, we have three of the Galilean moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. One of those is, is missing, so. All right, and so I think we will um, go ahead and go back to our, our telescope. And uh, Daniel, are there any other questions? Um, if there are any brief questions that I can feel? Um, there, was a, there was a question earlier from Nicholas Spender with the new J, uh, JWST launching in December, is there an opportunity for APUS to request an observation with it? There may be. That, that's uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST telescope is set to launch on December 18th. And let me tell you this, one of our former graduate students, Carl Starr, um, is a uh, manager uh, at the Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, a uh, manager for, a technical manager for the James Webb Space Telescope. And he is a really cool guy, has a great last name, Star, and has given talks to our student, student groups. But once things settle down and the the telescope, they have uh, did a shakedown of the telescope. Um, there is a um, standard procedure for requesting observations and he, you will have some competition, but if you're doing a, a project, let's say a master's thesis that uh, requires uh, interesting observation that can be done by uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, um, you know, certainly you can work with your professor on putting in a proposal, and that's how these things are done. All right, folks, um, we're a little bit over, and I really appreciate uh, you coming out, all the great questions, and hope you enjoyed our uh, star party from Charlestown, West Virginia, at the APUS campus. And uh, again, my name is Dr. Ed Albin, uh, chair person, uh, chairman for the uh, Department of Space Studies. Thank you so much for attending. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in uh, the continuation of our uh, conference tomorrow. Thanks so much and good night. And go out and look at the stars. See if you can find Jupiter, if it's clear tonight. Thank you, everybody. We hope to see you tomorrow. Uh, tune in at 9 a.m. for our first keynote speaker of the day, followed by a diverse array of panels. Uh, so we hope to see you there. Thank you. Good night.